Hello again. Uh, we're back for uh, this uh, last session of the day uh, on the industry track, and we will talk here more about like the, the how APIs can make more business driven uh, uh, products, uh, business driven strategy, and how APIs also can enable uh, a more ecosystem strategy directly uh, by providing the assets and the access of some internal resources that can be used by uh, many others in the industry. It can be partners, it can be customers, it can be developers. So we will talk about that in this uh, session with uh, different talks on the uh, the trends, actually, that APIs are driving on the business side, uh, on the how you can quantify the economy of API interactions and API transactions directly between the suppliers, API providers, and API consumers. And then we will talk about developer uh, uh, experience uh, and uh, and also strategies uh, to apply uh, uh, strategies and planning for financial uh, APIs. And we will finish by a talk about the state of current banking API regulation. So if you are interested to know what's happening in the world, you can uh, definitely uh, attend to uh, this talk. And now uh, we're really glad to have uh, Bharat uh, coming uh, with us. So Bharat Bhushan. Hello, Bharat. How are you? Hey, Mary. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, doing really well. Really glad to have you here. And so uh, I, I, I can't wait to uh, listen to your talk for the next 25 minutes. I will invite you to share your screen uh, with the attendees to be sure that everything works. Uh, so today I'm just going to talk to uh, talk to all the attendees. All of the materials that, that we normally share on the industry point of view uh, is available offline. So if anyone is interested, uh, they can get it through you or they can get in touch with us and, and we can share the materials. That's even perfect. Uh, so you are the slide deck. Uh, you are <laughs> live, live. Thank you very much, Bharat, and glad to have an open discussion at the end uh, about what you will share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and, and uh, uh, thank you ever so much for, for having me at, uh, at this wonderful event. Uh, I always love coming back here. Um, and um, so, so my name is Bharat, as, uh, as Mary said, and I look after our clients and our portfolio for banking and financial markets clients uh, across EMEA. And in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I'll share with you our experience of what we are seeing in the bank, in the world of banking and financial markets uh, across this region. I would love to, the, the, one of the reasons I, I have not used any slides is, is so that you can, uh, uh, I'd love it to be interactive. So if you have any questions, please uh, post them on the on the chat. Uh, the, the event team will post them to, to me and I can I can try and answer those questions as we as we go along. But and I'm going to try and provide you kind of a 36,000, 64,000 feet view on on kind of what what is really happening around the world of banking and and how you know APIs are central to um, to everything that is happening. So you know, the, the, there's never been a more um, important time uh, in in the world of banking, uh, particularly given what is happening. Uh, in, in terms of coronavirus and and uh, the effect on general population uh, around finance and uh, managing money and and being able to pay their their loans and and um, and mortgages and so on, um, and financial institutions also, like most businesses, have, are going through a um, very tough time. Uh, but but one of the things that the kind of cause and effect uh, of coronavirus has been that it it has accelerated the digital transformation for. Uh, for every bank, whether it is it was a small, uh, small size bank, challenger banks have always been digital from from the word go uh, to the far right of you know very large global banks. Uh, there's a whole raft of digital transformation agenda um, uh, being driven through the organization at a pace that we've never seen before. Uh, from projects like uh, being able to do self service onboarding, uh, use of chatbots in a very very common use case um, that that has been developed by several banks. Um, uh, around the world, uh, and be able to uh, to do other interesting self-service type capability from onboarding the customer to to serving the clients and answering some very very difficult questions on on chatbot, but some frequently asked questions as well. So so you know amongst all of this stuff, the the shareholder demand and the regulatory pressure hasn't been eased off. So shareholders are still demanding you know good return uh, on investments. Uh, and the, if you look at traditionally, banks made margins, uh, their money from the, the interest rates margins by you know, lending at a higher rate and, and giving savers a slightly lower rate. Uh, there, there are tons of other ways they make, they make their money as well. But predominantly, that uh, was the, the key factor for how, how they made money. And if you look at at least uh, in, uh, in, the, in Western Europe and, and in, uh, in other parts of the world, 
uh, interest rates are pretty much down to zero. In some some countries, it's uh, they're, they're, they're negative um, interest rates as well. And so um, the margin that came from traditional um, sources of revenue doesn't exist anymore. So financial institutions have to look at alternative ways of um, of making money. And this is where I will come back to the topic of marketplaces, ecosystem, and, and how, how are banks going about building those? What is important and what's the kind of the, the source, the secret source behind, uh, behind this? And one of my colleague, um, uh, Alan, is speaking tomorrow. And we'll go into more details around the the API economy and how how that 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 works. And I'll really encourage you to to sign up to that uh, session as well. So financial institutions are struggling uh, because of the the kind of compression on the on the interest uh, uh, and the income related to interest rates. At the same time, the cost of doing business, you know, especially after two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight financial crisis, they had only just about go back to, uh, to to the pre-crisis level in terms of their um, uh, return on equity and, and profitability, uh, on and and the the ability to to to, uh, to return that value back to the shareholders, um, and so I think in the next um, twelve to uh, twenty four months we're going to see a different world of banking and financial markets uh, emerging, and that would be in either creating new platforms, participating in, in platforms, but going beyond just the core banking industry um, uh, as well. Um, then, if you look at the the other side, and I'll come back to that as I said earlier, the the other topic is around disruption from the fintechs and uh, the tech giants as well. You know, they, we've, we've seen over the last, if you just look at the last six months, there have been announcements with um, uh, Goldman Sachs and Amazon partnering up to offer loans for the SME market, uh, small to medium sized businesses. Um, 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 City and uh, Google working together in in launching a current account, and so on and so on. There's there's lots and lots of announcements where these large technology companies are entering the market either jointly with the uh, with the incumbents or going out on their own and addressing some of the key niche uh, uh, capabilities. I mean, you know, Goldman Sachs and, and Apple, uh, for example, another example of uh, entering the, the credit card market uh, with all of the value creation use cases as well, with, where you're helping the end customer give that very smooth, clean experience that they're used to because they're used to using the, the digital platforms uh, from uh, in, in their personal lives, and they come to expect that kind of experience uh, from their banks as well. And then on the on the other side, fintechs um, have also been challenging the, um, the the banks. And and I think you know, about, about a year ago, most of my clients would would call that uh, disruption as death by a thousand needles because a lot of these fintechs were doing something very niche, very pointy, and they were taking a tiny bit of the revenue revenue away from the client and the customer experience away from the client uh, as well. Um, and but now you know they're becoming more mainstream. A lot of the challenger banks in Europe um, now have over two million customers, and so you know they can't, they have, they cannot afford to not take them seriously, and they have to to, to consider that. And as a consequence of all of the disruption in the fintech market, um, there's a larger drive to incorporate uh, fintechs into the into the broader ecosystem. Which again touches back onto the platform ecosystems uh, play as well, where banks have realized that it is no longer sufficient uh, for us to just create a financial product and expect that you know we build it once and, and everybody would want it. Because let's face it, no one wakes up uh, in, in the middle of the night sweating, feeling that they need a current account. <laughs> everybody has has a life event, and everybody kind of wants to make sure that they're prepared for often, as we're seeing now, um, unforeseen uh, circumstances as well. Uh, you know, it might be unbelievable, but you know, 66% of Europeans have have no savings whatsoever. So when times like this come, um, that that understanding of you know how do you manage money, how do you have those experiences that you want, but still have some money left in the bank, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, um, drive from larger, more incumbent financial institutions to help the end customers understand the value of money, understand the. Uh, the, the 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 consequences of you know if you do this if then that uh, kind of analysis right in the hands of the end customer and more and more utilization of the data uh, that the financial institutions have um, have been you know sitting on top of uh, a gold mine for the last uh, 50 60 years kind of that brings me to the next point around the regulatory change you know think about the data that that you know I know it's many of you represent. Um, uh, large financial institution on 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 this uh, uh, at this conference, 
think about the data that you have in uh, in, in your core systems of records, um, in your internal systems. And now with the advent of open banking, um, particularly if you're in Europe and uh, in other countries where, uh, for example, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Australia, North and South America, everybody's getting onto the, uh, the open banking uh, drive. And therefore, what that's doing is democratizing access to data. Okay. Of course, you need customer consent. And one of the things that we could learn from, uh, from some of the uh, markets that have been uh, fast adopters of open banking is that customer education is really important. That's why they would give access to their data to these third parties, perhaps fintechs, market aggregators, account aggregation services. Um, so assuming that all of that uh, customer education is, is in hand, the drive towards um, making the data accessible to to third parties, I think, is a is a groundbreaking. I don't think I'll ever see that kind of um, market change in my in my career again. This is a, a fundamental shift in how banks will have to operate and get used to operating in this new environment. So I think you know those clients that perhaps two years ago said we're just going to comply, um, you know, or we we or if they were not. Uh, under the um, the regulatory umbrella, then they would say, you know, we don't have a payment account, and so we're not going to do anything in this space. Maybe we are, we are a building society, and therefore we only have savings and mortgages, and we don't have any current accounts or payment accounts. But now I think you know, we're seeing over the last uh, 12 months a significant drive towards uh, digitization, and, and you know, digitization is is about, in, in my definition, is about you know, straight doing straight through processing, having virtually no back office operations where you're relying on uh, on human um, uh, kind of processes where people are looking at screen and making decisions. Um, in the end, all of the, whether it's payments or financial, um, um, some of the more complex things as well, will, will eventually get to a point, thanks to kind of the APIs and straight through processing, where the cost of serving that customer, the cost of operating as a business um, will become lower. Most of most of the large financial institutions tend to be in the 60 to 80 percent um, cost to income ratio, where some of the smaller, more digital native banks tend to be in the 30 percent, 25 to 30 percent cost to income ratio. So you can see uh, the, the kind of big divide between these two organizations and the larger organizations tend to be, you know, all of the, the, the projects that they're driving uh, tend to bring that cost to income ratio down towards 40 to 45 percent. Uh, because some of the costs they can't really get rid of um, things like running branches and cost of people and stuff like that. So they have to deploy those people and develop talent, uh, the new talent that's needed in the world of cloud, the world of APIs, the world of um, platforms and ecosystem, and not just on the tech side, uh, but also on the business side as well. So businesses are, the line of business people are more comfortable in using um, softer skills like design thinking, you know, doing uh, MVPs, which um, we've we've learned while working with um, with several uh, large banking clients is that that culture change takes a lot of time in in introducing to bringing both uh, the tech and uh, business together and driving that culture of um, uh, effectively infinite mindset and 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 doing things that are right for the customer. Um, one of our clients that we were working with building um, an agri platform where they're bringing in um, seed manufacturers. Um, fertilizer manufacturers to uh, building logistics uh, companies, providing weather information, soil checking information, you know, tons of this uh, value added services. And, and this bank couldn't even make money from uh, referrals as most of the Western banks can. But their definition of a platform was, look, we want to be relevant to our clients. We want to do things uh, to, for our clients that are adding value and making their lives uh, easier uh, going forward. So you know, lots of the thinking there was, that we want to do the right thing for our clients, and that will drive more revenue, uh, more stickiness with the customer, and they will. And as a consequence, for many of these clients, they've seen by building these platforms, which are beyond just the core banking products, they've seen a huge uptake in the in the daily transactions. So, so State Bank of India, Yono, are seeing more than five million uh, users interacting uh, with their new platform, Yono. Uh, they're generating tons of new revenue, but building. Uh, over a hundred partnerships uh, from travel and transport to groceries to uh, you know, fur furniture and, and fashion accessories, for example. And sometimes it does take that kind of mindset in a bank to, um, uh, to, to drive that new way of thinking, to drive that new platform and, and ecosystem. So you know, going back to the open banking uh, concept, the, the open banking change uh, around the world will drive more opportunities for, for everybody, in my opinion, because you know, there's a 
there's a fin not just you know we have a financial crisis uh, in our societies at, at this very point, and hopefully we can build tools and um, and techniques uh, where we can encourage uh, people to to save more and manage their money better and uh, and equally make their life um, li lives a little bit more efficient um, uh, as well. Uh, and there's tons of other regulations coming down the pipe uh, from, you look at just in the UK and European Union alone, uh, there are new payment initiatives for those of you working uh, in the Middle East, uh, for example, again, new payment uh, systems being implemented uh, from direct consumer to consumer payment and peer to peer payments uh, as well, using the central utilities built by the regulators, built by the central banks. Um, and I think you know, there's probably more than one story in that line where we're also, in my opinion, I think the the, one of the drivers for open banking and also building these national utilities is to um, reduce their reliance on um, corporations like Visa, MasterCard, American Express. So I think over time, these um, national utilities will see a huge uptake in, 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 in how those APIs are used to drive uh, payments uh, from, from within the country as well. And so, you know, as I said earlier, the um, all of these change that that is happening in the in the world of banking and financial markets is driving predominantly these five things. Um, number one, you know, enhance the core products by bundling products and services from other parties. And we, there are some obvious examples in this space, such as um, challenger banks uh, or some incumbent banks. You know, you can connect your bank account to your cloud-based accounting software. Uh, and therefore, as you do transactions, particularly if you are a small to medium sized uh, enterprise, uh, these transactions will be pushed out to your your favorite accounting software, and it can do real time uh, cash flow predictions and you know, VAT calculations and, and tax calculations and so on. But there are some more complex use cases as well uh, behind the scenes, and and it requires. And I will keep trying to connect it back to the APIs and and the reason you know you guys are here at the conference is is the the whole API economy. Um, and so, you know, APIs are really powering up this uh, this platform economy because those days of just doing a redirect. In fact, one of our clients that built um, uh, a similar mega app initially went down the route of just uh, just redirecting to a third party, and you can track your know, users' movements through uh, cookies and and what have you. But one of the side effects of using that uh, kind of technique is that you lose visibility of what is it that your clients are doing on third party websites. So some of the lessons they learned. Initial uh, in the initial launches was that you know, by bringing that experience in within the app itself, where people can book their their travel uh, from within the app, they get complete visibility and they get complete control on what the user sees, what experience they have, and they can use that analytic that data that they have the interaction data they have collected in understanding the needs of the customers better. So, for example, if somebody was booking a flight. Uh, from uh, you know London to to Edinburgh, it tells you that I'm looking for domestic flights. Versus, um, if I was looking for international flights, then the bank could potentially uh, propose a uh, an insurance policy, health travel insurance policy, or maybe uh, FX rates that uh, that maybe I, I get a special rate uh, uh, connected to my bank account, my bank debit card, so that I don't have to use other uh, you know prepaid money wallets uh, to, to for that good rate that most people love and want. So that bundling of products and services often leads to a very complex piece of work around app modernization. If you think about it, lots of these apps were written you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And as technology has moved on, as the industry has moved on, it often requires changes um, uh, to the core system. And as many of our clients are building these you know, new microservices and, and digital experience layers and digital agility layer, whatever you call that layer between your your uh, your mobile apps and your core systems of record, uh, for example, you know that a lot of our banks are our banking clients are building that layer. And so, as you hollow out the core, uh, you take functionality out of uh, the the core platform. And and typically, if you if you believe in component business model, you believe in buy-in, for example, as the industry players in defining those models, you know you're looking at building that uh, uh, capability in microservices out of the core. Uh, so that you're 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 more agile in building those new experiences for um, for your clients, um, and so um, uh, you know that 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 building that new platform uh, on the top of APIs and API economy is is right at the heart of it. Uh, majority of the time we spend working with clients, you know, how do you monetize the API, and that really is about data monetization. So how do you put value, particularly in context of open banking, where under under the regulatory regime. 
uh, many of the data, uh, um, uh, all of the banks in um, under the regulatory uh, regime have to offer that data for free of charge to these trusted uh, third parties or regulated third parties. So what can you do to uh, you know add another uh, another kind of premium API that you can charge for? And there's there's lots of examples. As I said earlier, I'm happy to share more content uh, offline. Um, so feel free to reach out via LinkedIn or, or through the uh, through the uh, uh, conference team. And so the the other point, uh, I'm conscious that I've got about five minutes left. Um, I want to talk about operational excellence. You know, I touched on this earlier on. One of the the, the effects of um, the pandemic that we're going through is that digitization is right at the heart of the um, the, the operation, from IT ops to building um, uh, you know, new capabilities within the bank. Everyone is thinking digital first. Uh, and, and customer experience first. Now it, this is really happening, where you're building that experience using uh, techniques like design thinking. You're working from outside in, whereas previously we, we all know that it was all about inside out, and we were these systems, these fields, and what can we build for our clients. Now very much it's about look, we are targeting uh, a small to medium enterprise, and within that we are targeting dentists, um, for example. You know, how can we build that experience for? Uh, the dentists or for the gaming industry or for x y and z where you know these guys just focus on the business that they're good at and we take away some of the banking problems around whether it's kyc financial crime anti-money laundering sanctions sanctions checking uh, which which historically speaking takes a lot of time and effort for financial institutions to build and and uh, and banks spend a lot of money in these back offices uh, processes uh, which could be uh, you know, optimized uh, going forward. So you know, the, the drive to digital uh, is powered by API, but also data and artificial intelligence behind the scenes as well. Uh, we're, we're getting to a point where the machine learning models are going to be exposed via APIs and microservices, where you can change that behavior of the, the, the application based on who is using the app. And this is, you're already seeing that in, in, in some of the banking apps as well. Uh, and um, you know, I, I just want to maybe finish on one of the the perhaps the the make or break uh, function. A lot of people sit on strategy. A lot of people, you know, we, we, thankfully we're not seeing uh, banks create a five year, ten year vision because you know that in the the speed of change, both geopolitical issues um, and uh, customer behavior and technology, you can't predict what's going to happen in five years time, but you can plan for um, the next two years and three years. And I think one of the things that financial institutions are doing now to prepare for that unknown future is the way, the new ways of working, ability to adapt. And, and one of the only ways you're going to do that is by training your people in the right and appropriate skills. Did the target operating model for a financial institution um, in 12 months time or 18 months time when they are going to be multi-cloud when they are going to be operating across uh, multiple products that are not just banking products or banking products that are built by them, it requires a different mindset, as I said earlier, from the line of business people to um, uh, to, to IT uh, organizations. So we're seeing a, a big drive in, in ways of operating, ways of working, uh, introducing uh, a lot more automation, whether it's DevOps, using cloud uh, for cloud economics, and uh, but also you know, building patterns um, so whilst a lot of our, you know, every every bank is uh, is moving to the cloud, and they want to give that flexibility to their developers, but they also want to put guardrails in place uh, to make sure that their their security controls are followed, uh, and uh, they can be a secure uh, bank to bank with. Because at the end of the day, they don't want that reputational damage that comes with uh, with some of the news that if things don't work out. So perhaps let me summarize by uh, by saying this. You know, I think as I said earlier, the, the the financial services industry is under tremendous pressure uh, from shareholders, from the regulators, from we are us as a customer because we're expecting more from our clients, uh, from our banks. Um, the financial institutions are, are putting digital and digital first strategy right at the heart of everything they're doing around the bank uh, for a couple of reasons, to reduce the cost, to make things more agile so they can connect the dots between the organization. And all of that is powered by APIs. Um, and therefore, API control, API governance is extremely important. Um, they're looking at new ways of um, of making money. So, if any of you are talking to your clients, you know, understand uh, what could you do to help your clients uh, make you know better returns on investment. Maybe form ecosystems and and partnerships again at the back of APIs. They, they that's the the pipe that makes that value flow from 
uh, from left to right or front to center, whichever way you draw your diagrams. Um, and ultimately, you know, keeping that that digital first agenda at the top of your uh, your, your client's uh, agenda. Um, I think there are about sixty seconds left. If uh, anyone has any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them on. We we have a question there. Uh, do you think uh, banks will be able to uh, keep up with innovation because of all the infrastructure and all the assets and the license and the regulation that actually is is an asset, but it's also a burden in these days. So do you think banks will be able to compete even if they have this burden, which is this legacy, right, to, to continue and, and if APIs can do that? Or no, yeah. banks should stay, should become an infrastructure and let other people do uh, new user experience? So, you know, I think that that question of will will bank will banks still be around? Uh, again, open banking maybe started that wave of discussion. And I think banks will be around for a number of reasons. Um, you know, if you look at even, you know, I don't want to, um, uh, say that this is only for the millennials or the or the kind of the, the younger generation, but but people like digital services. You know, they like um, uh, being served in a in a seamless manner at the time they want, how they want it. Banks will have to look at new revenue streams. They will have to find new ways of making money because the old style of making money is not going to work anymore for a number of reasons that we talked about earlier. Can banks stay relevant? I think you know there's one thing that that uh, these large incumbent banks have, which takes a long time to build, is trust. Uh, the fact that you know most of people, most of the kind of the people would feel comfortable putting their money in a large bank in a deposit or in a current account, knowing that their money is safe, um, is a big factor, and that takes a long time for the general kind of population to build up with a startup uh, challenger bank. Um, although it is accelerating thanks to the last few years of, of debate, but I think you know if banks can, can can continue to keep up with the pace of change. They don't have to be the first mover in, in a lot of these spaces, but they do need to be a fast follower in creating these platforms and creating these experiences uh, and be be part of you know other ecosystems as well, not just their not just their own. Yeah, slow movers but fast followers. Yeah, it's often what we hear in the. <laughs> but yeah, when when they when they know what to follow, they can go strong and they and they can be really good. Uh, thank you very much, Bharat. Thank you for uh, your presentation. We already have a uh, good feedbacks in, in in the chat. And uh, and yes, so if people do want to continue the discussion with uh, people from IBM, you can go on their on their uh, booth and expo in the expo to uh, continue uh, uh, the discussion and the debate and also the strategy, right? And we have a talk of Alan Grickenhaus also tomorrow about understanding API strategy for uh, for banking. Thank you very much, Bharat. Have a good one. Thanks for having me again, really really uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your deep knowledge.